Hello, everyone, and welcome to a question and answer event with Dr. David Sinclair. I'm Michelle Darian, a registered dietitian here at Inside Tracker, and then today's host. So, Dr. David Sinclair needs no inter introduction, but here we go. Dr. David Sinclair is a geneticist at Harvard Medical School and a co founder and co chief editor of the journal Aging. He's an inventor on 35 patents and has received more than 35 awards and honors. We're proud to have him on our team as the chairman of the Inside Tracker Scientific Advisory Board. Three years ago, Dr. David Sinclair published his book, Lifespan, Why We Age and Why We Don't Have To. Lifespan has remained a very popular read over the years. And based on the hundreds of thoughtful questions that we received, today's listeners are very familiar with your research, book, and podcast. We've selected a few of the most commonly asked questions for our listeners to chat to David Sinclair about today. Here, we also have two Inside Tracker registered dietitians in the Q&A chat as well. Thanks so much for being here today. It's great to be here. Uh, thanks for having me, Michelle. Awesome. Um, so you discuss intermittent fasting in your book and your podcast lifespan, and received, we received many questions about the specifics of intermittent fasting. So who would you say intermittent fasting is best for? Who is it not for? And are there any blood biomarkers that can indicate whether uh, fasting is either right or wrong for you? Gee. Well, um, we, we are all different, but um, I believe that most people over the age of 30 um, should not be eating three large meals a day. Uh, it's just simply too much for the average person. Now, if, if you're running... 30 miles a day. It's different, of course, but uh, just looking around at humanity, you know, most people are in a, a calorie excess. Um, and also, even those of us who are are not overweight, uh, we do consume too many calories throughout the day. Um, and what the science says very, very clearly um, is in animals, um, and even if you look at populations who live a long time, they don't eat constantly. And we need to get away from the idea that being a little bit hungry or without food for um, you know, 15 to 18 hours is a bad thing. Um, probably go going back you know, most of the 20th century, there was this idea that three square meals is the way to go. And then even worse during the early 21st century, uh, it was this idea that you need to fill in the gaps between meals with snacks and little protein bars. Um, if you go back and look at where all this advice came from, a lot of it was commercial, uh, commercially driven. Um, breakfast is the most important meal of the day, comes from post cereal. Uh, and you can already just even imagine how many, how much money is being made from the protein bars uh, and the snacks that go between meals. Uh, but yeah, the science is very clear. Now you asked me, how do you know if what you're doing is good or right for you? It's extremely important to measure. You have to measure things and what you, you can't optimize what you don't measure. And this is why um, I was one of the early people at Inside Tracker going back now uh, 12 years ago uh, when it was just uh, three people at the company and I was one of those three. Um, I've always believed that you need to measure things. And so for intermittent fasting, you can measure your ketones, which uh, you can breathe into, into a device. Uh, but in terms of a blood test, which is what I typically do, um, I look for improvements in blood sugar levels, lowering of uh, inflammation, uh, which includes CRP, and cortisol. Um, and I also, it's very important not just to bring those down and, and be healthier, but also what you want to do is make sure you're not deficient in anything. So you, if you're fasting or you go on a strict diet, um, I try my best to be vegan. I'm not always successful, but someone like me needs to make sure that I, I'm, I'm not lacking B vitamins, particularly vitamin B12, which is mostly usually from animal products. But I look at my B vitamins, my magnesium, uh, sodium, I look at hormone levels to make sure that they're all okay. Um, and I use Inside Tracker to do that. Awesome. And you mentioned blood sugar and then um, and CRP as well. Um, do you happen to have any specific biomarkers that you like to track over time specific for longevity? Yeah, a lot. Um, sure, I think I'm probably one of the most measured people on the planet at this point. So uh, what, do I, what do I like to do? Well, so I hope the Inside Tracker put together their list of of measurements that go into the inner age calculation uh, 1.0 and now 2.0. Yeah. And, and so I pay attention to everything, but the things that I've noticed with my clients, with my own family, myself, uh, are that there are some key ones that you want to pay attention to uh, within those 40 or so uh, markers that Inside Tracker gives you. 
Uh, one of the most important is, is fasting blood sugar and HbA1c. HbA1c, many of you will know, is more of an, an average of blood glucose levels over about a month. It's glucose attached to a hemoglobin protein. It measures the percentage that's been modified by the glucose and attached to it. And that gives you an idea of how good your insulin sensitivity is and how well your pancreas is working. Mainly, it's an indication of um, your trend towards being insulin um, insensitive, which is what happens with age, um, typically. And one way to, to extend life, we believe, is to maintain uh, really uh, optimal uh, and relatively low levels of blood sugar levels throughout your life instead of watching them creep up with age. And often they, they not often, but if you don't watch it, can also go above seven and a half, eight percent of uh, HbA1c. And then that is uh, right in the zone of type two diabetes. So you want to stay down in a uh, low level. So I try to keep mine around five or so. Um, I also, I, I measure myself with a continuous glucose monitor as well. So glucose is important. Um, so also briefly, uh, so I mentioned CRP, this is an inflammatory marker that would be important. The usual things, cholesterol, I try to keep my ratio of good cholesterol to uh, uh, total uh, to be way less than five. Mine's around one, actually. So that's yeah. quite uh, a number. It's taken a while to get it there, but uh, I'm there. Um, longevity, I like to look at albumin. Uh, often um, companies don't or doctors don't think about albumin, but albumin levels... Uh, go down with age. Uh, and it's very good, at least correlate. It's not a predictor of longevity, it's a correlate. And I have a theory that that old albumin and damaged albumin is, is toxic. And it's maybe one of the reasons that having what's called plasmapheresis or dilution of the blood, taking out some old albumin, put in new stuff, um, is, is seemingly very healthy for animals at least. So those are some of the things I pay attention to. Um, they'd be the main ones. Um, other than that, I, I try to optimize all my micronutrients and my vitamins to make sure that they're, they're really steady. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks so much for that information and that explanation of how those are related to longevity. Um, so you talk a lot about the supplement resveratrol and how that relates to aging. Can you briefly describe what resveratrol supplements do, um, and how they're associated with the aging process? Yeah. Uh, it's going back a, a fair way I was 32 when we discovered that uh, you could activate one of the enzymes that we showed is involved in in slowing aging. Um, and so the brief history of, uh, and I'm actually now looking across the Charles River here in Boston, I was over in that building there and uh, in Lenny Garenti's lab as postdoc discovered that, um, co-discovered that sirtuins control yeast aging. But we couldn't genetically modify our bodies the way we did the yeast cells just by putting in extra genes for sirtuins. We needed to activate the enzyme and get it to, to work better. And uh, with uh, my collaborator, Conrad Howitz, uh, we co-discovered that there were plant molecules called polyphenols that activate the sirtuin, en uh, sirtuin enzymes and could actually triple, uh, and in some cases raise the activity by tenfold. And the one that at the time was the best was resveratrol from also found in red wine. I'd never heard of it before. Um, but we published a nature paper in 2003 that showed that resveratrol directly acts on the enzyme and makes it more active. Um, and we've done a lot of work. It's It's been attacked scientifically. We've shown that those attacks were were wrong. Um, and so now we're, we're left with the, the field um, is uh, has verified that resveratrol directly binds to the enzyme makes it hyperactive. Uh, and in doing so, the sirtuins go out and they protect the body from various toxins and damage and inflammation. There are hundreds of papers on this now, so I won't list them all. Um, but resveratrol, if it's taken with food or at least something that it dissolves in, uh, you can get the blood levels up to in the micromolar range, which is what you need to activate the enzyme. And if we give it to mice that are on a high fat diet, they can actually, uh, live as long and be as healthy as a, a mouse that's on a, a really healthy lean diet. And uh, which is really good because uh, in this day and age that we live, our diets are very rarely optimal. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Um, it's so interesting to see how that's evolved too. Um, so some of our attendees mentioned that they participate and compete in both endurance events while also pursuing longevity. Um, do you think that individuals can do both simultaneously? 
I do. I do. And I, I think if you get it right, you're likely to live longer and healthier than someone who doesn't do both those things. But it's not as easy because what you're trying to do is to put your body into a state of adversity or perceived adversity. And some of the molecules that, that do that, such as metformin, um, do it by actually inhibiting the body's ability in partly to make energy. And so if you combine metformin at this, exactly the same time as when you want to want to train, you'll feel a bit weaker. And that's the reason it seems that uh, you don't end up bulking up your muscle as much uh, if you take metformin uh, during times that you work out. But you can do it. Uh, what I do is I, I, I transition. I, I pulse things. And so I don't work it out, work out every day. That's for sure. Um, but I also don't take metformin every day. And I try to to do that. It's also the same with fasting. If I'm not going to do a lot of exercise, I'm happy to fast for longer. Um, but if I'm, if I need extra uh, brain power or muscle power, I, I will eat a little bit more on those days. And, and you'll get used to your body. Um, the more you measure and the more you pay attention to your body, the more you'll be able to optimize things for yourself. Um, but that's where we're at. We're in a state where you need to know yourself better than your own doctor would ever know you measure things and time things and, and just exercising the same every day and taking the same supplements and drugs every day, um, at least for longevity is probably not the best approach you need to figure out what the combination is. Um, and that's partly what my next book is going to be about. That's awesome. Um, so that actually kind of leads me into the next, um, into that next point. So I think one of the most exciting aspects of science is that it's ever evolving. Um, are there any new insights um, since you since you published Lifespan? And is that something that will be included in the next book? Yeah, well, hopefully uh, you've all read Lifespan. <clears throat> if not, it's still really relevant, actually. Uh, it was a little bit too prescient. Uh, I said that we were going to have a pandemic and that uh, telehealth was going to take over. And, you know, within a few months, it pretty much did. Uh, and so th that'll happen very rapidly. But so it's really relevant to today uh, and the science behind it, it's, it's really just a it's, a, it's a textbook for longevity. So when you read it, you actually understand why Inside Tracker does what it does and why I do what I do with my life. And if you go to page 304, you can actually see it listed out. It hasn't changed a lot. Uh, there have been a few things that I've added that I talk about in my podcast, um, but it's essentially the same protocol every day. And I continue to to do that. My father, if anyone's wondering, is still in perfect health, even doesn't even need glasses for driving, which at 83 is rather astounding. Um, but there are some additional things that I do. Um, let's see. One of the things that I, I do now is I eat differently. I actually, I as I mentioned, I'm, I don't eat meat and I don't eat uh, dairy as best as I can. I'm not always successful. Uh, and that's really also improved my biomarkers beyond what I had in lifespan. So I, I didn't appreciate in lifespan the the real impact that diet can have. I was more focused on the science and supplements and exercise and hot and cold. Um, so there's that. Uh, what I'm super excited about that has happened since lifespan is that we've published the epigenetic reprogramming work. When I wrote the book, um, I was still researching it. We had made the discovery. We hadn't published it yet. So actually the world got to learn about epigenetic reprogramming and the information theory of aging before my colleagues did. Uh, but it's now out. We published that on the cover of Nature magazine in 2020, uh, a year after the book came out. Um, and it's been uh, very well received. There's been, it's probably now close to $10 billion invested in this field um, and hundreds of labs working on it. So it's it's exciting what's happened since. Uh, the information theory of aging continues to grow in popularity and understanding, and it's helping shape the way we understand why we grow old, but even more importantly, how we may not need to grow old and how to reset the body. And what we've done since then is we've actually gone into clinical trials, uh, at least, no, I should say preclinical. Today is actually the first day that we, we've started reprogramming the body of a non-human primate uh, to get ready for curing blindness, hopefully uh, in humans in maybe two years from now. Um, and uh, we've also now in the lab been able to reverse aging in the brain of old mice and get them to learn better. And uh, we're working on other tissues. We've got skin and kidney and muscle and whole mice. 
and uh, and all that's looking really promising. Looks like it's working. Uh, and then, so really, the the way to think of what's happened since the book is that uh, it's really captured the scientific world by storm, and now it's pretty easy to drive aging both in the forwards direction. If you remember those ice mice in the book, we can make them all age, uh, and then we can now bring it back again. And now we're doing multiple things. We're going forwards and backwards, forwards, backwards, and, uh, and having fun with that. Uh, where I want to go, if you're going to ask, um, we're trying to think of what's the next generation of drugs. So I mentioned we're making medicines to cure blindness with gene therapy, uh, which is in, in uh, the book. But we're working on our pills that you could take to reverse the aging of your body. And so that would be the, the ultimate dream that we could take a course of pills for a few weeks and go back a couple of decades in time and then just repeat that every time you got up to a certain age. Wow. Yeah, that would be really exciting. Um, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here today and being and answering all of these uh, really great questions. I know our attendees really appreciate it. Hey, that that was too quick. <laughs> Should we keep going? <laughs> I, can, I can take one more question. There's lots of questions coming up on the chat. Okay, great. So we have a question here about metformin um, and homocysteinables. If you want to dive into that. About metformin, what? And homocysteine levels. Wow, that's that's rather detailed. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, so you, with with metformin, um, you can see a rise in homocysteine levels. You don't want homocysteine to rise for a number of reasons. It associates with heart, heart disease and also can mess up your DNA methylation um, and methylation in general, which is driving, we think, partly the AG process. Um, and so I you definitely want to monitor your homocysteine levels and make sure that if you're on metformin or something else that might affect it, um, let's see what else can affect it. If you take a lot of an NAD booster, there are some thoughts that it might deplete methyls from the body by excreting nicotinamide as methyl nicotinamide. Um, you can make sure that your vitamin B levels are maintained. Okay. And some people take trimethylglycine or also known as betaine, um, or you can just take uh, vitamin B, supplements, uh, B12, B6, B3. These are all uh, helpful ways to make sure your homocysteine levels don't get too high. Awesome. Thanks so much for that for that extra bit of information. And thank you so much for being here and being an incredible guest. Hey, thanks for uh, everyone for joining. We'll do it again.